For the first time in its history, the NBA has had back-to-back -back years where multiple players have scored 70 points in a game. Which made me ask, does the NBA have a defense problem? Over the past two decades, the NBA has witnessed a dramatic escalation in scoring. From the 2002-2003 season, teams have seen their average points per game soar from a modest 95 to an impressive 114. As the current season unfolds, this number is climbing even higher, with an average hovering around 115 to 116 points per game. This data, sourced from both NBA.com and BasketballReference.com, underscores a significant transformation in the sport. We're seeing faster paced games, a surge in three-point shots, and players who are more offensively skilled than ever before. But what does this mean for the future of basketball? Are we experiencing the pinnacle of offensive play? Or is there more to this story? In this video, we'll dive into the trends, rule changes, and strategies that have elevated scoring in the NBA, potentially favoring offense over defense. We'll examine how these elements have shaped the game we love today. But first, if you're enjoying the content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and stick around until the end. Your support means a lot, and if you find this video insightful, sharing it will help my channel a great deal. Let's get started. Now, where should I begin? Let's delve into the cause for my research. In late February, ESPN's Tim Bontemps and Kevin Pelton reported that the NBA's competition committee is reviewing the balance between offense and defense, igniting widespread debate across NBA media platforms. On an episode of Gil's Arena, former pros Gilbert Arenas, Rashad McCants, and Cheryl Swoops discussed whether the perceived defense decline was simply a matter of effort. Long on these stats that look good, mm. but at the same time, it's like, you know, if we apply more pressure, um, if the team actually, like, bites down on the defensive side, like, does it look the same? Does it look the same? But you can't take nothing away from him because he's skilled enough to still make it happen. 32, 16 to 16. It's just it's a lot. I, like that. I, don't like the, I, I don't like the idea of there's no defense and people are not trying to play defense. That's just, that's just a horrible narrative. It's, the game is different. It's the, the, what I mean is the game is different. There's no, there's no more liabilities on the court. But Gil, ain't nobody guarding nobody. How hard was that's it to guard? Obvious. No, how that's hard, obvious. How hard, how, hard, how hard was it to guard your team with all those stars on it? That was hard as hell. Okay, so nobody's sitting in the, they couldn't sit in the lane and do all this stuff. Be, hello, are you gonna leave me and you gonna, you gonna leave me and leave Cooper? Well, there, you gonna, there, wait, every there game are, wasn't there a blowout. There are a lot of teams out there like we had. No, there's not a lot of teams that had like superstars, right, on one team. But now you have guys who can spread the floor. So when I decide to drive, I have a specialist now. I actually have a specialist that he's only in the game to shoot threes. So when I drive, like, yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. There's no more dead weight. There's guys. But if you know he's a specialist and he's in the game to shoot, don't help off of it. Right. We we force ah, him to pass it okay. to the guy that's not the specialist. So now, so that here we go. Don't help off of him. So when I drive now, and you say no one's playing defense. Yeah, because no one can take, take. There's no more taking the charges. There's no more of that because there's specialists out there now. So the, the, the floor is wide open. So when you got your one-on-one -on -one guys coming through the lane, there's no one there to help. But there's been specialists before. In the history of the game, there's always been a shooter on the it floor. Has. Uh, special. Uh, you said it. A shooter. Or two. Or Ooh. two. Or three. Okay. Jordan, right? Jordan. <laughs> Who that can put 30 on the score, and then his his counterpart, there's no there's no Scottie Pippen types anymore, right? There's no guy who's gonna put in 16s. That's the fucking fourth option now. So why there's are they not, not the fourth every game though, Gil? Huh? With your with everything you're saying, the Phoenix Suns shouldn't lose. Because there's no defense that can Every, guard them. Everybody's the same. There's no defense. Everybody that's... is built the same. So why are they losing games if nobody Everybody can guard them? Everybody is built the same now. Are you not? Do you? And I'm watch asking basketball? you a real. I'm Do asking you a not question. watch how? Why? Why is Joker doing what Joker's doing? Right? With the same team. His team is built to do something. If you're gonna help, you're gonna duck in. If he's gonna help up, I'm gonna throw the lob. You if you're gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna set it free. I'm gonna post up. You wanna switch? Push the switch? I'm gonna post this guy. If you're gonna hard show, like, they, they, we're, they're more tactical now because they have more weapons. Oh, we were just talking with. about Phoenix, now we're talking about them. I'm sure, I'm yeah, telling you, there's more. This got me thinking. Could it really be that straightforward? Have teams just stopped playing defense? So I thought of a time when effort on the court would be undeniable. 
The NBA playoffs, of course. The playoffs are the ultimate test of a team's mettle, making them the perfect parameter to gauge whether it's truly an effort issue. To my astonishment, the data revealed a different story. Since the 2002 playoffs, scoring has consistently risen from an average of 96 points per game to a staggering 110. This information, also collected from basketballreference.com, shows that even with heightened effort, strategic game planning, and a slower pace, playoff scoring is on just as much of a rise as regular season scoring. The scoring in the playoffs is approximately 2.5 points lower than the regular season, and in recent seasons, this gap has slightly widened, but that does not take away from the point that the NBA scoring continues to trend upward no matter if it's regular season or postseason. Let's examine a specific example, a comparison of the defending champion Nuggets against the Timberwolves during the playoffs versus their regular season match. Right here we have a game from last year's playoffs. Ant and Rudy are going to get into a pick and roll action. KCP is guarding Ant and Jokic is guarding Rudy. Roll it. Rudy sets a solid screen or poke. Jokic goes into a drop coverage. As Ant was about 27% on one dribble pull-ups during the season last year. Ant initially takes the screen, but he sees Murray sagging in to help. He crosses over to come back to the screen as KCP fights over the screen and Ant nails a tray. Okay effort. You can tell that Denver doesn't fully believe that Ant will make those hints. The drop coverage. Now switch to this season. Same teams, same players, same action. Rudy again sets the screen. As he's rolling, we see the coverage is to blitz Ant this time, which is a more aggressive approach from the playoffs last year. As Ant was beating that coverage in the playoffs and his jump shot has improved, he's up to 30% now on pull-up trays, which is still not that good, but if you add late shot clock situations, somehow he gets slightly better. He shoots 32%. Ant takes the screen, gets his shoulders by Jokic, and gives him a hesitation that freezes Jokic and Ant just blows by Jokic with a dunk. I would argue that's pretty solid effort by Denver here. Ant was just too athletic. So if it's not just about effort, what else could be driving the scoring surge? Does the NBA have a defense problem or not? Let's consider the rule changes. Back in the 2001-2002 season, the NBA transitioned from illegal defense rule, which prohibited zone defenses, and required defenders to actively guard someone in the paint to the defensive three-second rule. This new rule allowed zone defenses, unlike its predecessor, but it still required defenders to dance in and out of the paint every three seconds to avoid a violation. Interestingly, the change was meant to aid defenses. In the same breath, the NBA reduced the backcourt violation time from 10 to 8 seconds, compelling teams to advance the ball more quickly and inadvertently boosting the game's pace and scoring. A few years down the line, the NBA abolished hand checking, aiming to ramp up scoring. This was a response to the 2003 finals, which not only had some of the lowest scoring in the decade, but also suffered from the lowest TV ratings. A mere 9.29 million viewers, according to Nielsen. The immediate effect? Scoring dropped about 4 points from 93 to 97. And playoff games saw an almost 10 point increase from 88 to 97, as reported by basketballreference.com. That was the most significant leap post hand checking man. From then on, scoring stabilized, fluctuating between 97 to 100 until 2015. While many attribute the rise in NBA scoring to the end of hand checking, it was just a catalyst, not the sole driver of today's average scores reaching 115 points. Let's pivot to the 2017-2018 seasons. Rule changes which reshaped the game's tempo. The restructuring of timeouts is a case in point. Teams retained their seven timeouts, but their duration was cut to 75 seconds each, phasing out the longer 90 second breaks and the misleading 20 second timeout, which was actually about a minute. This prevented teams from stockpiling timeouts for the final quarter, ensuring just four timeouts in the fourth and only two in the last three minutes. The result, a more fluid in-game and increased overall playtime. Moreover, the NBA's decision to reset the shot clock to 14 seconds after offensive rebounds instead of the full 24 significantly upped the game's pace and possession. The pace leaped from the mid to high 90s to 100 the following season, and scoring jumped from 106 to 111 points per game, a notable five-point increase. These changes paint a clear picture the past decade's rules were designed to boost the game's watchability by accelerating the pace. But here's the twist. These changes don't fully explain the defensive side of the equation. Scoring is up, but so is shooting efficiency. Teams' field goal percentages have surged from 44% from the field and 35% from beyond the arc 
in the early 2000s to nearly 50% and 40% respectively. What's behind the sharpshooting success? Stay tuned as we delve deeper into the mystery of does the NBA have a defense problem? You might have noticed me skipping over the years 2015 to 2018 while discussing rule changes and scoring. This isn't an oversight. It's a prelude to discussing another critical factor that's reshaping defense and inflating scoring, and that's trends. The 2014-15 season marked a pivotal moment with LeBron James's return to the Cleveland Cavalier. Alongside Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love, this trio transformed Cleveland into a formidable force. Love's three-point shooting, in particular, added a new dimension to the offense, providing space for LeBron and Kyrie to maneuver and score. Love's role was crucial, not just for his shooting efficiency, but also for the volume of threes he attempted. Prior to joining Cleveland, he was second in the league for three-point attempts among big men, averaging just over six and a half per game, trailing only behind Ryan Anderson, whom Ryan only trailed the legendary Steph Curry in the entire league. With a 38% success rate from beyond the arc, Love and Anderson was a trailblazer for big men shooters, being the only two big men to be in the top 50 in three-point attempts that year. Fast forward to the current season, and the number of big men in the top 50 for three-point attempts has quadrupled, each launching well over six threes a game. This evolution has led to more teams to be like the Cavs and Ryan Anderson's New Orleans Pelicans to adopt spacing-focused offensive strategies, such as four out, one in, or five out sets. This approach has stretched traditional defenses, prompting teams to field smaller players capable of perimeter defense, but leaving the paint exposed. Starting in 2015, big men's three-point attempts rose from barely one per game at a 23% success rate. Today, they're shooting about three threes per game and making at least one at a 32% rate. While not stellar, it's a significant improvement. Let's examine the ripple effects this trend has on defensive strategies. Let's return to a game from the 2014-15 season where the Cleveland Cavaliers face off against the Detroit Pistons. The Cavs are set up in a four-out, one-in formation. Mozgov, the big man inside, joins Kevin Love, Kyrie Irving, and LeBron James around the arc. Mozgov and Jared Smith initiate a 2-5 pick and roll, moving help side. Detroit's lineup includes guards KCP, Jackson, forwards Prince, and Moreau, and center Drummond. As the play unfolds, we see Jackson slide over to help, leaving Drummond and Moreau isolated. Needing to make the correct defensive read, Prince can afford to leave LeBron James unattended. As the action continues, Drummond opts for drop coverage. Jared cleverly snakes across the lane, engaging Monroe. Monroe reacts as any big man would, sagging into the paint to protect the rim. However, this leaves him vulnerable to what comes next. Pause here. JR spots Monroe out of position to defend the three. Only a foot out of the paint, he lacks the speed to contest Kevin Love's impeding three-pointer. Resume the play and we witness Monroe's belated attempt to close out, only to get his eyes dotted as he lumbers out to contest. Fast forward to this season, featuring a clash between OKC and the Celtics, both top contenders in their conferences. With shooting big men now commonplace, you'd expect defenses to adapt. OKC sets up a high pick and roll, starting in a 4 in one out set but transitioning to a five out, eliminating help side options. Only Boston center can realistically assist SGA. The lineup is crucial here. OKC boasts top shooters at every position. With Dorton SGA in the guard spots, SGA the mid range maestro shoots 50% from that range and just under 40% from deep. Similar to Dort, Giddy position in the weak side is more lethal than his 34% catch and shoot average suggests hitting 40% specifically from the left side. J. Will occupies the dunker spot, drawing Boston's formidable defender White, who can't afford to leave OKC's most versatile shooter. Then there's Chet, the big man dilemma, shooting 40% on above the break threes, which he opts for instead of rolling. As the play rolls, Boston faces a tough choice, concede an SGA mid-range shot or a Chet three-pointer. Tatum works to get over the screen, SGA is pressuring Porzingis to decide. Porzingis drops back, and in today's NBA, help is scarce. Defenders are reluctant to leave their assignments. Even if they do, the positioning of OKC's players in the corners makes it nearly impossible to contest an above the break three by a seven footer, no less. If help arrives, it's likely too short to challenge Chet's shot effectively. The defense only options are for Porzingis 
to show and stick with Chet or to switch. But both choices have drawbacks. A switch leaves the paint open for SGA, an assassin and MVP candidate, guaranteeing a score. Or it forces Porzingis, who lacks lateral quickness, to guard SGA, a classic catch-22. As the play concludes, the inevitable occurs. Chet sinks the three, with Porzingis two feet in the paint. This evolving dilemma is reflected in the increasing distances NBA players traveling during games, as tracked by NBA.com. In the 2013-14 season, big men were traveling just under one and a half miles per game, while guards were slightly above that threshold. Fast forward to today, and guards are running close to two miles each game, with big men not far behind, often surpassing the one and a half mark, and nearing two miles themselves. This uptick in distance covered translates to greater fatigue, and when players who aren't naturally defensive specialists become tired, the first aspect of their game to suffer is unfortunately defense. Shooting big men aren't the only trend shaping the NBA. On the West Coast, while the Cavs were revolutionizing the game with their sharpshooting bigs, the Warriors were pioneering their own strategy and eventual trend, small ball. Their famed death lineup, Andre Iguodala, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, and Harrison Barnes, boasted a net rating of plus 40, wow. despite Harrison Barnes being their tallest at 6'8". This lineup achieved an astounding defensive rating of 94.9 and an offensive rating of 135.1, according to NBA.com. They may have sacrificed size, but they were a menace on the court. Five players who could dribble, pass, and shoot, a rare combination than you might expect at the NBA level. This lineup propelled the Golden State Warriors to the best record in NBA history. 73 and 9. It presented a defensive conundrum for opponents, seemingly without any weaknesses. The secret? While lacking a traditional big man, they compensated with length and sharp shooting. The average height was about 6 foot 5, while shooting 53% from the 3 and 60% from the floor. But the Warriors weren't the originators of small ball. Many teams had experimented with this approach, including the We Believe Warriors of the 2006 2007 season who, with a lineup of two guards and all forwards, Aaron Davis, Monta Ellis, Jason Richardson, Stephen Jackson, and Al Harrington, upset the number one seeded Dallas Mavericks in the playoffs. Yet none executed small ball better than the eventual NBA champion Warriors upgraded death lineup. With Andre Iguodala, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, and Kevin Durant, who joined the 73-9 Warriors after their finals loss to the Cavaliers. This lineup boasted a plus 23 net rating in the playoffs wow. and went on to win two championships. Let's examine all three iterations and see how they turned the hardwood into a nightmare for opposing teams and defenses. Starting with the We Believe Warriors first. Crunch time. About 30 seconds left. Baron Davis brings the ball up the court flanked by Steven Jackson, Matt Barnes, and Jason Richardson. And Beardrins, the lone big man. The Mavericks adapting to the situation have also gone small with Harris. Howard as the sole big man, Jason Terry, and Jerry Stackhouse. With BD heating up, the Mavs double him as soon as he crosses half court. He quickly shovels a pass to Jackson. Jackson probes, seeking an opening against the shorter Terry. Meanwhile, Beadrins cuts baseline. Howard momentarily follows, but then peels off to help elsewhere. In traditional offensive lineup, this might be fine, as the guards would be covered, and the weak corner would typically house two big men. But not in this case. A true center who hasn't attempted a three all year this year, is the only big man on the floor, creating an overload on the weak side with all wing players. Howard's decision to leave his man opens up a vulnerability since Dirk can't cover both Beardrins and Barnes, given that Barnes is a shooter and not another big man who would not be a threat from behind the arc. Howard's choice ultimately cost them the game. Jackson realizing Howard is guarding no one, finds his all the smoke co-host, Matt Barnes, after Beadrin sets a timely pin down screen on dirt. Barnes capitalizes with a dagger three-pointer. Next, we have the original death lineup of the Warriors versus the Clippers. The Clippers are running a more traditional lineup with Redick and CP3 as guards, Rivers on the wing, and Blake and Jordan holding down the power forward and center positions. Iggy and Steph execute a side dribble handoff. CP3 trails, and Blake is the one ball defender. Iggy rolls to the hoop, drawing Blake, while Draymond sets a secondary screen on CP3. Notably, Iggy, who would be a traditional power forward like Karl Malone or Tim Duncan, opts for a V-cut to the arc instead of rolling to the basket, which would typically draw Blake's help. But Iggy's shooting ability and athleticism mean Blake can't afford 
to help too much with him opting to veer towards the three instead of the basket. Draymond at 6-6, screen CP3, freeing up Curry for a look. And Curry doesn't need much space. As Draymond rolls, Jordan should ideally step up and blitz Curry, but doing so would trigger a chain reaction ripple effect. As it results, Curry nails a deep tray. This brings us to the upgraded death lineup, with KD illustrating said ripple effect in a game against the Timberwolves, coached by the defensively astute Thibs. The Warriors run a similar play. Gibson does what Jordan should have done in the previous clip, blitzing Curry on the pick and roll. Curry, ever the sharpshooter, instantly makes the smart pass to a rolling Draymond. Draymond spots the defender setting up for a charge and whips a cross-court pass to Klay Thompson, arguably the second best shooter in history. Wiggins makes a valiant effort to close out on Klay, but it's too late. The other big man in this lineup is Kevin Durant, one of the greatest scorers ever. His defender, Cat Carl Anthony Towns, is in the restricted area and has to traverse half the court to contest KD's shot. All this chaos stems from a single side screen and roll, showcasing the Warriors lineup full of guards or bigs with wing-like skills, that being KD. Finally, we come to a shift that's less a trend and more a natural evolution of the game. As basketball's global reach expands, so does the emphasis on early training and development, leading to a new generation of highly skilled players. We are witnessing a wave of tall, athletic big players who possess guard-like abilities while retaining their traditional big man skill set. Players like Chet Holmes, Evan Mobley, Jaron Jackson Jr., and the likely rookie of the year, Victor Wembanyama, exemplify this. They can dribble, pass, shoot, block shots, and rebound. Well, to an extent, rebound. These players are having impact on both scoring and defense. But with all the skill, one might expect a corresponding increase in defensive prowess. Surprisingly, it has, albeit with a caveat. Historically, having a big man on the floor has correlated with a better defensive plus minus. Since 2003, the average defensive plus minus with big man on the court has been positive. In the 2002-2003 season, the average was roughly even, but it has since trended upward despite trends and role changes favoring offense. Currently, when big men are on the floor, the defensive plus minus is nearly at a half point advantage. The story is different for guards, where the absence of defense is most seen. Following the removal of hand checking in the 2004-2005 season, the average defensive plus minus for guards has continued to decline. There are numerous reasons for this, with more skilled big men on the perimeter, traditional guards, those being six foot to six foot four, find themselves at a disadvantage against taller players, sometimes up to seven feet tall. The officiating of physicality on the perimeter doesn't help either. While hand checking is prohibited, if a big man can jostle for position without committing a foul, there should be some leeway for similar contact on the perimeter. The league has attempted to address this post All-Star break this season, allowing slightly more physical play around the arc, which has led to a decrease in scoring by about four points. Part of this is also due to the development focus for guards, which in my experience as a former guard at various levels tends to emphasize scoring over defense. Conversely, big men often receive more defensive training. So does the NBA have a defensive problem? I would argue no. It's facing an evolution challenge. Implementing rules to enhance defense could detrimentally impact the game and other aspects of the game, potentially rendering it unwatchable. However, evolution could lead to adjustments in how the game is officiated, promoting more competitive play on the perimeter. There may also be a need for a philosophical shift at the grassroots level regarding the importance of defense among guards. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, go ahead and like this video. If you like this video, you might want to watch the video in the center here that talks about the NBA MVP race. Until next time, peace.